I've received my first love letter. <laughs> I never thought I'd be so privileged. Even after having ordained to receive a love letter, that's quite something, isn't it? <laughs> it's signed from the Ra Dharmishtha Rajagiriyans who love you deeply and want you to be safe. Okay. Who's behind this? People are concerned. When the weather's bad, about Swami Nohansi traveling, I think what we should all do is just try and earn as much merits as we possibly can. I'll, I'll, I'll take your advice. It says, you know, the, when you put it this way, I can't deny it, right? You have said on many occasions that we are all your fathers and mothers from previous births. See? Can you see where they're going with this? I have to eat my own words now. Hmm? So, Swami Nuhan, sir, we solemnly request that you listen <laughs> to those who've been your mothers and fathers. All earn as much merit as we possibly can then everything will happen as it should happen. We'll be safe, safe enough so that we can cross the ocean of sansar. That is why we do merits. That is why we do merits. Your merits bring you here. Your merits bring me here. My merits bring me here. My merits bring you here. This is not a one-man show, as I've always tried to explain to you. And I think you understand that. It's the community that come here that make all this happen. The Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha, all three make the noble triple gem. And you are part of that Sangha. So, provided we continue to do good merits and we are focused on a noble course, things will work out okay. Don't worry about it. Don't fear. And we have uh, these Anagarika Mahatyas, they, they're quite happy to make sure the Swami Nuhansis are safe and they will go to whatever length is required. They'll go as far as, I'm sure they'll sacrifice their lives for that. They do it, they do it because that is what they want to do for the sasana. You know, we all understand, ladies and gentlemen, each and, in, each and every one of us individually, we understand that the sasana, the Buddha sasana, is far more valuable than any of us individually. That's the thing. The Bodhisattva understood this. The Buddha understood this. We all understand that the sasana is far more valuable than any of us individually. And that is why the Buddha, he spared no expense. There is nothing that you can, you or I could say that here's something that the Buddha could have done, but he didn't. There is nothing like that. And the great Arahants who walked the surface of this earth, there was nothing that we can say, here's one thing that he could have done, should have done, would have done. No, anything that could have been done was done. Anything that should have been done, it was done. Because each and every one of them, they understood that the sasana is far more important and precious than, than each of any of us individually. So the sasana must thrive. It must prevail so that we can achieve to our salvation. But once again, I take on board what you have given to me. This is so now is formal. I thought, I thought at least you try verbally first. But it's all in written, for, <laughs> written form. It's all formally provided. And now there's no denying. But as much as I accept this, I request that we all engage in as many merits as we possibly can.
so that we can all make this journey plain sailing. It's possible. It's possible. Your blessings? Do you think it's only the Swami Nuhansis who can bless? Hmm? Do you think somehow we have some special entitlement that makes us able to bless everybody else and not the other way around? That's not how it works. Blessing is, blessing is rooted in the joy that is born in the heart. It comes with love, it comes with compassion. Metta, karuna, mudita and upeka. If you have these, these four things in your heart, you are entitled to pass on your blessings. We pass on our blessings every day, every time we do a merit transfer, don't we? So, we, we pass on our blessings for a worthwhile cause. Of all people, you must understand now that there is no such thing called an individual. Yeah, we understand that there is no such thing called a self. So therefore, it makes no sense to think that someone blesses another human being. One blesses another. It makes no, it makes no sense to, do, to think of it in those terms. These are all chittas. So a chitta makes a blessing. A blessing is an energy. An energy that is born when the mind makes a firm resolve. And that energy has an influence, has a power to, make, to create a conducive environment for another chitta to be safe, to be free from harm, just as much as you can curse. So that's how curses and blessings work. You know, these are not just superstitions. You can bless, you can curse. It's all possible. But you don't need people for that. You don't need an individual. You don't need a self for that. A blessing is born of the, from the heart and a curse is also born from the heart. What it does, ladies and gentlemen, is it creates, a, it creates an environment. When you create an environment, an environment is something that is conducive for Vipaka to be drawn. Let me explain that after we've observed the precepts. <laughs> Others will get carried away. And then at 10.30, I'll start precepting you. <laughs> right. Let's bring our palms together then. In veneration of the perfect one, the magnificent one. Our greatest blessing. And therefore, he is the blessed one, the fully awakened one, the Supreme Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arhato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arhato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arhato samma sambuddhassa Bless us. Blessings and curses, right. The reason that blessings and curses do actually work is fundamentally because there is no such thing called a self. If a self actually existed, you would not have, you would not be able to bless you would not be able to curse. I'll explain. Let's start with something simple. I'm going to first of all explain to you what a cause is and what a condition is. Okay? So there are some things called causes and there are things called conditions. When a cause and a condition, or multiple causes, multiple conditions, causes and conditions combine, you have what we call effects. Let me put it on the board. Because <clears throat> you've often heard this, the expression, when causes come together, you have an effect. That is true, provided the conditions are right. That's a caveat.
sorry. <coughs> When causes come together in the presence of conditions, you get an effect. I'm going to explain this to you with using a simple example first of all, right? There are a bunch of causes with you right now but there's a particular effect that i want to get out of you which i can't right now because i haven't created the conditions for that but the causes are there with you so try and follow the the metaphor that i'm using here to explain this principle okay so there are a bunch of causes with you right now what we don't have is the conditions at the moment I put the condition in, you will see what I mean. The effect will be born. Right? You all have these causes. Because you will all have learned what it is called. And therefore, you all have the causes. And you can all, you can all see. Right? Your eyes are functioning. You can see. You have Vipaka to be able to see. Meaning you have the causes for it. Now I'm going to prove to you. At the moment I create the condition, the effect is going to be born. Right? If you're ready. What word came to your mind? Hmm? Pen or marker pen. That's the word that came to your mind. I created a condition. I created the environment. For an effect to be born, where? When I showed you the pen, the perception of a pen, was it born here? Where was it born? It was born over there. It was born with you, right? So where, where do you think the causes were then? With you. That's why the effect was born with you. If the causes were here, then the effect would be born here. Because where there are causes, that's where the effect is going to manifest. Make sense? But although you had the causes, the conditions weren't all right. There were some conditions, for example, the air is transparent. The medium that we're using here, the medium that we have, the air is transparent. If the, if the air was not transparent, then perhaps you would not have been able to see, even if I put the, put the pen up here. So there are, there are already a bunch of conditions which are conducive, which is what we call the environment. This is the environment. These conditions are the environment. You need the environment. In the environment, the causes when present give rise to an effect. So, um, what we're trying to learn and understand here, ladies and gentlemen, is how the principle of cause and effect works. Although we always talk about causes and effects, there's also a part of the environment. Some schools of thought might actually include the conditions as a, as a, as a cause. There's no harm in doing so, as long as you understand that it's all, it's called cause and effect. And there is nothing fixed, right? It's all born because of conditions and causes and all of them coming together. The, 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 the basic premise of all this is you don't have an entity. See, for example, this pen being up like this right now is not an entity, meaning it's not a fixed thing, which is why as I adjust my arm, its location changes. Meaning its location or the fact that it is up here, wherever this is on a three-dimensional grid, it's not fixed, is it? It's constantly being fed by the causes. If it, was, if it weren't constantly being fed by causes, I could just put it up here once and take my arm away and the pen should rest there. 
Mustn't it? The very fact that I have to constantly keep providing energy. Now, if, I, if this battery runs out, what's going to happen? If this battery runs out, what's going to happen? What do I mean by a battery? It's an energy source, right? If this energy source runs out, then the pen's going to fall. Why is that? What does that tell us about why, how the pen is up here? Because there are, there are, there's energy constantly keeping it up here. So it's not like there's one packet of energy and then we can mind our own business and the pen is going to remain there. That's not how it works. So do you see that this pen being present here, here, wherever this is on the X, Y, Z axis, right, is not an entity. It's not fixed. It's not determined. It's not like once you put it there, it's there. Forget it, done and dusted. That's not how it works. Nothing in this world is like that. You have to constantly keep providing causes and providing the conditions. So once again, some schools of thought will include conditions as one of the causes. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just, uh, all I'm doing here is simply separating the two, splitting the two up. You can just think of it as an additional piece of information. But it's perfectly fine if you wanted to put the conditions as another one of the causes and understand it in a, in a very simple sense. But in reality, this is what's going on. You have a bunch of causes. When the conditions are right, those causes will manifest as an effect. Now, isn't this why, although you have lots of karma that you've done, right? the, the many karmas that we've done, they've generated vipaka. Remember the great elder Maha Moggallana, right? Oh, as we know him as Mughalan Maharatan Vansi. Even in his last birth, right, he died a very painful death. Not mentally, physically. He died a very painful death, having become an Arahant, because of a karma he'd done many, many, many lifetimes ago, and that was killing his parents. So that was a, a heinous sin or a pancha anantriya papa karma. But it didn't always come to him. You know, it's not like once you do a karma, it just constantly, you're constantly being supplied by that vipaka, you know, until that, that vipaka expires. It's not like that. Just because you have done karma and there's vipaka that's generated as a result of that. Every time you do a karma, just imagine, it generates some energy. This is, this is a packet of energy. I'm, I'm really simplifying things here. Sometimes maybe even oversimplifying things. But as long as we understand the concept, that's enough for us. And I'll be the put, first to put my hand up and say, this is not how the Buddha must understand this because I don't know how the Buddha understands this. In other words, this is a simplified model for us to make sense of the world. Do you remember when we studied physics and they talked about how electricity travels on a wire? We learned the principle that electrons travel one way and the current travels in the opposite direction. Remember? And then we had various ways in which under, we could understand, you know, how electromagnetic forces. I can't remember them now. Fleming's law? Yes? Either it was this one or the other one. Anyone remember? That was many years ago. I've forgotten some of the specifics. Ah, we have a physicist in the house. Which was? Logan. Sorry? Lawrence force. Which one was it? Left hand, right hand? Electrons left. Okay. So you had the current going one direction. Electrons going in the direction of thumb. So magnetic field, current, and then the movement, right? So these were the three factors. You're just as bad as me. Wait till mommy comes down, I'll speak to her. <laughs> but you, you get the idea. Thank you, Daniel. 
you get the idea, right? So we learned, if you remember, if you recall from physics lessons back when we were at school, you'd explain that if there's positive and, and a negative charge, electrons would travel in one direction, but to explain how physics works, you had to exp we had to work on the assumption that the current travels in the opposite direction. In reality, nothing actually travels in the opposite direction. In real terms, there are only the electrons that travel where there is a higher density of electrons, it travels to a lower density of electrons. But for us to make sense of the world and for us to be able to explain things simply, it was, we learned that there was a current that traveled in the opposite direction. Gravity is the same. But no more about that on another day. Gravity is a concept that we have invented to help understand how things work. We use it to explain what we see around us. Sometimes it's not really what's going on out there. In the same way, what I meant to say here is, this may not be exactly how things work, but that's okay as long as we understand. We get the concept and it helps us to get Achieve our, achieve our goal, which is, which is Nibbana. So, coming back to the point I was trying to make earlier. Whenever a chitta performs a karma, okay? Whenever a chitta performs a karma, as an example, when you do an almsgiving, now you'll be doing one later on today, offering something to Swami Nansi. When you do that, in your mind, you'll have wholesome karma. Right? The, 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 the chitta, as it's born, will have generosity, will want to give. The act of giving is a, is a meritorious deed. But remember, when the act of giving is performed by the chitta, the karma of giving is also born. It happens at, the, at that moment, and therefore the vipaka that is to do with that karma is generated. And that vipaka almost settles somewhere, let's just say somewhere in the cosmos, now, don't ask me where, because that's not how it works. That's not how it really works. When you were younger and you asked mommy, Mom, where did Aya come from? Or where did Mali come from? What did your mother say? Hmm? The stalks. <laughs> or you went to the supermarket and Mali was there. Because all we needed was an answer. Somehow something to make sense of the world for the time being. Later on, you discovered for yourself how Mali was born. Your parents didn't have to do, it, do any of that. You discovered that for yourself. In the same manner, I just want to get a concept across. So this is, this is crude. This is a crude ex, uh, exposition of how karma and vipaka works. But it's close enough to the truth to help us understand. Vipaka... When generated, let's just say it, it's, it's there somewhere in the cosmos. So here's the dana that you offered. This is the dana. Almsgiving. Okay? Then you offered someone a lift. You offered someone a lift and you're, you brought them to the, to, the, to the sermon, right? So you offered someone a lift. That also generated karma. Then let's say uh, what do you do when a mosquito lands on you and prepares for a hearty meal? Hmm? What do you do? Okay, what did you used to do? <laughs> yes. Right, so what do you used to do? Right, yeah, exactly, yeah? What it used to do, maybe, maybe some months ago, maybe some years ago, right? Swatting a mosquito, right? So that's also here. So that's killing the mosquito. That's also here. Then, um, let's say, you, you, went to the, you, you offered flowers. You offered flowers to the Buddha. That's there. Uh, let's say you lied. Okay? You lied to someone. That's a lie. So, as you can see, there are a bunch of karmas that you've done. 
each one, it's all ready. They're all ready. It's not like they need time to prepare. It's always ready. What's always ready? The karma that you've done and the, and the energy that you've generated as a result of that is always ready to come to fruition. But it doesn't until the conditions are right. Once the conditions are right, then these vipaka start to come to fruition. Which is why right now, although we've done plenty of good things, plenty of bad things, right now we have the conditions, we have the environment in this room for all of us together for only specific vipaka to come to fruition. Now you see we have the blinds around us. Therefore we don't see what's going on outside. We used to be able to, right? So those days you could just turn your head and you could, you could look at the, the, the skyscrapers. You could look at the trees outside. If it rained, you could watch the rain. But then what happened? Then the fairy godmother, the little angels, what they did was they put blinders around us. And then what happened? Now, although there is vipaka, shall I prove to you that you still have vipaka to see outside? What do you have to do for that? Just lift the blinds. The moment you lift the blinds, what you're doing is you're changing the conditions. And therefore, you're creating once again the environment to start drawing on specific vipaka. You don't need to work out the math. Right? You don't need to decide oh, which vipaka do I need and which vipaka is drawn to which conditions. You don't need to work that out because there are plenty of combinations. There are an infinite number of combinations for every condition that you create. There is, there is ample, there's an abundance of vipaka just waiting to happen. Start thinking about how powerful the vipakas are and also how serious therefore we must take them and why Swami Nath is always going on about the environment that you create is everything. After all, environment is everything. Now, think about this for a second. I'll come to blessings and curses, right? Think about this for a second. Why is it so important to keep away from ignoble association? What happens when you're among bad friends? Exactly. When you're among, among bad friends, people who do bad things, people who are vile, people who are vicious, people who are evil, then you start, you create the conditions, you create an environment, actually not you create, the environment is now ready for bad karmas that you've done in the past to come to fruition. That's how it works. But what happens when you are in the association of good friends, noble friends, like the environment you've created here? See, now, do you hear Swami Nuhan say swearing at you? Do you hear bad words, swear words? Is anyone shouting at you, screaming at you? But have you not screamed, shouted at, yelled at people enough times for there to be enough karma for them to come to you? There are. But right now, we, the conditions are, are different. These conditions that are present at the current moment, this environment is conducive for your meritable karmas to come to fruition. That's why right now you're listening, you're hearing the Dhamma. But until we started this sermon, although you had the karma, you didn't hear any of the Dhamma. You know, it's not like whenever you want to hear the Dhamma, you can hear the Dhamma. Although you have karma to listen to the Dhamma, it's not like you can listen to it whenever you want, because it is not you who listens to it. Therefore, you don't get to decide. What happens is, as the environment is created, now it starts drawing upon this, this, this karma. That's how it works. So, when I show this pen, what happens? I create, an, I create an environment, I create the conditions for the perception of a pen to be born in your mind. When I put it away, see, now you can't even if you tried. You can remember a pen, 
you know, you can, you can pull it back from memory. You can remember how Swami Nuhan said, held the pen up a moment ago. But that is not as vivid as this, is it? That's from memory. This is by sight. Now, is there anyone here who is capable? Before that, let me say this. You seeing this pen is a Vipaka. Agreed? This is a Vipaka. You seeing this pen is a Vipaka. This is what we call a, a sight Vipaka. Okay? So Vipaka can come in various configurations. Sight is one. Hearing is another. Smell is another. Taste is another. And so on. Right? So your five sense organs along with your mind, they work to bring to fruition the Vipakas that you have done. Can you bring in my Vipakas? Can you get uh, draw on my Vipaka? You can't do that. You draw on your own Vipaka. You seeing this pen right now, ladies and gentlemen, is a Vipaka. This is what we call a sight Vipaka. Is there anyone in this room who's capable of bringing to fruition this sight Vipaka once I hide the pen? I dare you do that. Go on, if you can. I don't, I'm not referring to the memory of the pen. Of course, you know, even right now you can, by memory, you can recall how Swami Nuhansa held the pen up a moment ago, right? But can you actually bring this back? The sight of the pen back, can you bring it back? No, but don't you have Vipaka to see a pen? You do. How do you know? See? You do. What do I mean by this? If you didn't, the moment I hold the pen up, you should go blind. Once again, if you didn't have the Vipaka to see this pen, the moment I hold the pen up in your line of sight, you must go blind. The only reason you didn't, and the only reason that you actually see the pen, is because you have Vipaka. But what I've created is the conditions, or the environment. So therefore, do you see that these two things must come together for the effect of seeing a pen to manifest? Does this sound like French? This is, this is making sense to you, ladies and gentlemen, is it? Just give, me a, uh, just give me a nod either this way or that way, or at least, I don't know, diagonally, if you like. <laughs> Madam? The last bit did or didn't make sense? Yes. Let's go over that again. All right. You have the causes. My task is to create the environment or the conditions, right? Let's set long conditions is one word. Otherwise, you'll still be confused again. I, whenever I say conditions, I also mean the environment. So we can use these two words interchangeably. Now, it might be that another Swami Nuhan say, or even myself on another day might talk about environment and I'm actually referring to causes. It's okay, right? We don't need to get hung up on words, right? <laughs> Today we call a cat a cat, right? Tomorrow someone say they change, they change the rules, right? They say, no, from today onwards, you have to call a cat a dog. What are we gonna do, protest? I mean, does it matter? As long as we know what we are referring to, we can all come to a, 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 you know, a consensus that when we refer to a, a cat, which is now a dog, is, is still the same animal, who, why do we care? Right? So we, need, we must not get hung up on these words. The Buddha's advice, this is not just mine, the Buddha's advice. He, said he, 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 he advised his disciples not to get hung up on words. Because he said, if you do that, you will lose the essence of Nibbana. You will lose the essence of, of my teaching if you get hung up on words. You might have seen that there are, you know, this is going on now. There are certain places where they, they are so 
concerned about whether it's anitya or anicca and and you know then now it becomes an argument what's the, why did the buddha preach the dhamma so that his disciples could argue with each other hmm so they could come up on mass media and start debating with each other that's why the buddha preached the dhamma right for incalculable eons and then some right he strived as a bodhisattva to discover the dhamma and then in a life span which is less than what 8 years now we have an opportunity to understand the dhamma we have been so fortunate to listen to the dhamma we have been so fortunate to understand the dhamma and look at what people do today they use the dhamma to debate amongst each other you know it is said when the bodhisattva chooses as a deva to come into the human world he looks at a number of things right he 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 looks to see whether who his mother is supposed to be whether it's the right time the right place and so on yeah i i i feel if the bodhisattva had were to do it today he think to himself no <laughs> oh no 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 <laughs> these people they just don't deserve it if you if you if you find a diamond right and you know the value of a diamond would you use it as a plaything would you no would you use it to fight with each other you know like when you fight with pillows at home you throw pillows at each other right if you if you if you actually came across a diamond and you understood the value of a diamond would you use it for that purpose you wouldn't right because you understand how precious it is and how rare it is well unfortunately people don't understand the value of the dam no wonder because if the dam hasn't made an impact on them if the dam hasn't made a transformation within them then of course you don't understand the value of the dam until you sip on your mother's milk how do you understand the value of it unless you felt a mother's love how do you understand the value of a mother we can all talk about a mother's mother the value of a mother because we've all experienced what it means to have a mother so only those who have experienced what the dhamma can do for them at least 1% will only will actually treat the dhamma with due respect and use it for what it was preached by the buddha ex- expounded by the buddha but unfortunately people just waste their time pass away the years and an invaluable lifetime when they have the dhamma but they make no use of it but we must not be like that therefore i say from time to time we might use you know the the words can change the terms can change right today i call it a cause maybe the following day i'll say this is one of the conditions let that's not the problem as long as we understand the concept and it helps us to find solutions to the suffering that's going on in our minds we are all winners aren't we right pen right you all have causes the causes are with you so for now for this for the purpose of this conversation when i refer to causes i'm meaning the the vipaka or karma that is about to become a vipaka okay let's just say this is this is karmic energy at the point it comes to fruition we call it vipaka is that okay happy with that so this is karmic energy at the point it comes to fruition we call it vipaka all right so we have karma this is karmic energy you all have karmic energy and in reference to the example that i'm about to share with you you all have karmic energy to witness this sight which sight the sight of this pen how do we know this you can see it that's how you know it you can see it do you not have the karma to witness a red pen this is a black pen how about a red pen do you not have the karma to witness that hmm do you how can you tell how, how do you know think before you answer mothers and fathers 
How do you know whether you have the whether you have the karmic energy to see it? You can't tell. You can't. You can't tell until you see it. How do you know whether you have the good fortune to win the lottery? That will help you answer that question. How do you know whether you have the good fortune to win the lottery? You can't tell until you win it. You can't tell until you win it because you're not the Buddha. Here's what the Buddha can do that you and I can't. He can look at this. He can look at our accumulated karmic energy. And he can, he can, he can prophesize. He can say, in another hundred thousand lifetimes, you will become a Buddha. He can say, if you go home tonight, you will die. Because he can look at your karmic energy. He understands how conditions and causes come together to create an effect. So therefore he says, if you create these conditions, such and such causes will come to fruition and this effect will manifest. Ta-da! That's how the Buddha foretells the future. The reason that you and I can't foretell the future is not because we don't, it's not because we don't know. You know, if you had the three causes that creates a fire, right? Temperature, something combustible, and oxygen. Do we not know that if these three things come together, there's always going to be a fire? So we know that for a certain effect to manifest, we know the causes. Science has helped us in that way. But the conditions must be right. The Buddha is able to look, he's able to scan, let's say. He's able to see because he has a special, he has a power through his wisdom eye. He can, he can look at what karmas we've done in the past, infinitely into the past. What karmic energy we have accumulated. And therefore he knows, he knows when these conditions are right, these causes will come together because he can see all of the causes that are there at any given moment. Right? So these causes, if they come together in these conditions, now this effect will manifest. You know, this is like, it's, it's quite, to, for the Buddha, it must be as simple as solving a formula. A simple quadratic formula. The reason we can't come to that conclusion is because, although we understand something about conditions, we understand that particular causes must come together for a particular effect. What we don't understand is what are those, you know, do we have those causes? It's almost like, think of it this way. Imagine you had a backpack, okay? And in your backpack, you had various things. Now you're a traveler, you have various things in your backpack. Two people are stood in a, in a queue. This is you. Can you see that from where you're sat? You can't, can you? Sorry. Okay, this is your backpack. You have a bunch of things in your backpack. We all do. <clears throat> But you're looking forward, so therefore you can't see what's in your backpack. The only th way you can know what's in your backpack, well actually there are two ways you can know what's in your backpack. What do you think there? Number one, put your hand in right, and pull something out and see what comes. That's how you can know what, what's in your backpack. And once you've emptied all of its contents, now you can tell, well, that was what was in my backpack. But the moment you pull it out, you can, you can no longer say that is in my backpack, right? It was in my backpack. But there's another way to find out what is, what is in your backpack. What can you do? Ask this guy. Now imagine this guy had x-ray vision. Hmm? Imagine this guy had x-ray vision. Now he can scan your backpack and he'll tell you 
each of its contents. Each and every one of, your, one of its contents, he'll be able to tell you. That man is the man that I'm referring to as the Buddha. That is a special psychic ability that the Buddha has. That's why he was able to say, Specific individuals will most certainly go to the heavens when they're dead. Like in the scriptures, in, the, uh, in, various, on, in various instances in the Buddha's life, you read the Buddha's life, there are plenty of times where he'd, he'd prophesize what was going to happen. It's not magic. Nothing in this world is magic. It's all logic. All you have to do is understand that logic. The difference between us and those who understand the logic is that. Simple, simple as that, they understand the logic. If you don't, you don't. That's it. The Buddha understands the full logic. He understands logic in its entirety. Someone once asked, what is the extent of knowledge? How far can you go? What is the extent of knowledge? Right? We know a lot of things. Right? We, we learn at school, we learn at university, we learn in life. Right? But what is the extent of knowledge? There's a, there's a wonderful answer to that. The extent of knowledge is what the Buddha knows. You can't know more than that. And how much does the Buddha know? That's the next question. How much does the Buddha know? That's the extent of knowledge. So how much the Buddha knows? He's as much as anyone can know. And the, the extent of what can be known is how much the Buddha knows. Because he has a power called the Sarvagnata Jnana. That's why we call him the Sarvagnya Nvahansa. Sarvagnya is omniscient. It's not like he's always walking around with all, everything in his mind. That's not how it works. Right? It's not because he wouldn't be able to do anything. I, all of the world's knowledge was always in his mind. Like in, the, in, the, in the forefront of his mind, he wouldn't be able to do anything, right? Like he's walking for arms and he, he knows that it's going to rain in America. <laughs> he wouldn't be able to do anything. Because remember, each chitta, even the Buddha's chitta, can only take one object at any given time. That is a universal law about all chittas. Even the Buddha's chitta, once it, ar once it arises, until it passes away, a second object cannot, cannot be taken. So when the Buddha is looking at something, he's looking at that. He can't be thinking about something else at the same time. That is the same for all of us. But the, the, the way that the Buddha makes use or utilizes his ability, or his, his ability for omniscience is whenever he, whenever he wants to know, whenever he wishes to know, he can. But I'm not qualified from here on to explain to you how all that works <laughs> because I don't know how it works, frankly. After all, he's the Buddha. If anyone of you wants to find out, if anyone wishes to find out exactly how the Buddha does that, there's a way. No, there is. I'm not kidding. There's a way. What is that way? <laughs> Become one. <laughs> Become one. And then you will. For the time being, Let's just settle for the fact that a Buddha is able to foretell the future. He's able to prophesy. He's able to tell what's going to happen to you tomorrow because he can check, he can scan your karmic energy. And that's how sometimes the Buddha makes a, makes a choice. Should I preach to this man or not? He can tell. There are many occasions, ladies and gentlemen, where the Buddha chose not to preach to certain individuals. Chunda, Chunda Sukara, a famous example. He had an avatar, you know, next door to the Jetavana Rama, not our Jetavana Rama, Jetavana Rama back then. I, they, it was, uh, so he butchered animals, swine. That's what he did for a living, he killed pigs. And the Buddha looked at his karmic energy and realized there's no point in preaching to this man. He's not going to be able to understand the Dhamma. See, to become a Sotapanna, which is what the Buddha's intention would be, 
if you can't send them to the heavens, at, then, I mean, if you can't be help someone become a Sotapan, at the very least, he would try to help someone go to the heavens rather than go to the hells, right? But to become a Sotapan, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard it referred to as the fruit of Sotapanna, right? Yeah, Sotapanna, Pala. No, I didn't ask you to leave. <laughs> it's called, it's called the Sotapanna Palaya, right? Right, the fruit of Sotapanna. See, the fruit is the effect. A fruit is always an effect. So, for the fruit of Sotapanna, stream enterer, to arise within your mind, you need two things. You need causes and you need conditions. I can't give you any of the causes. In fact, not even the Buddha can. That's yours. You have to create your causes. That's why we do what? What's the M word? That's why we do merits. One moment, madam. I'll come back to you. That's why we do merits. Merits create karmic energy which in the presence of the Dhamma, in the presence of noble association. Have you heard of Parato Gosha Pratya? Yeah, Parato Gosha Pratya is one of the conditions that needs to be available and it, and it can only be created by a noble person. By a noble person, I mean someone who is at least a Sotapanna. Someone who, by, who themselves is at least a Sotapanna is able to create the conditions. That's why you call it Para. So Para to Gosha Pratya. Para is another. Uh, this is a little bit of a singular lesson. Para is another. That's why you call them Pereta. You've heard the word Pereta? Right? That is, these are beings who rely on the good, on, on the charity of others. That's why you call them Pereta. It stems from the word para. Para is another. You've heard parasuddha? <laughs> Do you remember your grandfather used to say that? Uh, those parasuddhas when they were <laughs> when they were here. Why para? Para is not belonging to us, belonging to another. That's what it means. So the 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 the, the meaning of the word para is another. Parato gosha pratya. Gosha is Sound, okay, gosha, forgive me for using singular, singleese terms, it's, I'm being unfair on our listeners online who, <laughs> they're trying to make a sense of this and then on top of that now they have to understand singleese as well. I apologize profusely, but I'm, I'm trying to help my audience here to understand what this dynamic is. So parasha, Parato Gosha Pratya is the conditions that have to be created by an external individual. And that individual must at least be a Sotapanna. In his presence, in his or her presence, where the Dhamma is being preached, and you have the merits, and you're contemplating on the Dhamma, right? when these things come together, now the fruit of Sotapanna is born within you. That's how one becomes a Sotapanna. Remember, it's a fruit. It means it's a product. So a product to be born requires causes and it requires conditions. So you must have your causes. Conditions will be created externally. Conditions are created externally. Causes, that's your homework. You must bring your own homework. Question, madam? Yeah. Wonderful question. I'll come to that after we finish on the pen, okay? So the good lady's question was, when you attain Nibbana, is there karma left? Is there residual karma? Good question, isn't it? Brilliant question. Madam? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. If the conditions, conditions of oh, then where are the conditions? There. 
If the conditions are constant, yes? Yeah. Yes, madam. Yeah, because these are the vipaka. Yeah, so this, this is your karma. When, when it's ready to come to fruition, we can call them vipaka. When we speak in terms of karma and vipaka, this is how cause and effect works. If you are in bad association, but you know that that is bad, then you have the conditions to know that that is bad. So therefore, although they may be doing bad things, your vipaka will not start drawing there because you, what you bear in mind is also one of the conditions, isn't it? Yeah? So, when I say external, it is mainly, chiefly external, but the way you feel, you know, these are all, these can, all of these can be, can be conditions. In fact, so much so that each chitta, when it passes away, it leaves the condition for the next chitta. It creates the environment for the next chitta. Uh, and I mean, that's why you can, you can hold a conversation with someone. That's how you can continue a sentence. You know, that's why what we say is meaningful. Uh, you know, this is a train of thoughts. It's a train. Each carriage is connected to the next. How so? When the two are not present at the same time. How does it do that? You know, it's not like one overlaps the other. There's no overlap at all. When one passes away, that's when another, the next one can, ar can, ar can arise. But what each one does is it creates a condition for the next chitta to arise. That's why at one point you're going to have the magga chitta and then you're going to have the pala chitta. What was that about? When you, when you elevate from a prutakjana to a sotapanna, the chitta that arises before the sotapanna pala chitta is called the sotapanna marga chitta. Or the Sotapana Magga Chitta. It's referred to the path consciousness and fruit consciousness. Those are technical terms. But what that means is this creates the path for this. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a law, a Chitta law, a Chitta Niyama, that if the Sotapana Magga Chitta arises, then the, next, the, the immediate next chitta will always be a sotapanna pala chitta. You can't change that. That's how things are. So really, what we are trying to do is creating an environment for the sotapanna marga chitta to arise within you. Because once a sotapanna marga chitta arises, then the sotapanna pala chitta will most definitely ensue. But that is an extra bit of detail we don't need for the time being. Uh, what was the question I was trying to answer? The pen. Was it the pen? Did I answer your question, man? Okay. So, I was asking you, yes, I was asking you, right now you know, this is the lottery, right? So right now you know that you have Vipaka to see a black pen. Do you have any more Vipaka to see a black pen? No, right? No, right? Yes, right? No, right? Yes, no, right? What's the answer? Don't know. Don't know. Just because you won the lottery once, can you say whether you're going to win the lottery again? You don't know. So how do you know if you win the lottery again? After you won it. It's always after the fact. I mean, if you could tell exactly which lottery you had to buy to win it, I mean, that wouldn't be a lottery, would it? But the Buddha knows. So the National Lotteries Board would forbid him from buying lotteries, you could see. <laughs> if the Buddha was still here. They wouldn't let him buy them. Because he would know exactly which one to buy. <laughs> so, do you have any more Vipaka to see a black pen? Hmm? Well, let's try our luck. Ah, there will still be Parker. 
No? Do you have any more hypocrisy of black men? Don't know. No? Yes, we had. We have. Not necessarily had, we have, right? So we have. Right now we have, right now we have, right now we have, right now we have. Why do I keep saying this like a broken record? Because I love the sound of my own voice? I mean, there is that, but <laughs> why, why do I keep saying there, it's, there is, there is, there is, and there is? Because each one is an individual chitta. It's not like there's one chitta that's seeing a black pen. That's not how it works. You understand by now that these are individual chittas that last how long? Approximately one and a half hours? Then half an hour? Ten minutes? No, it only lasts the lifetime of a chitta, which is referred to as a chittakshana. You can't put a time on it. I, you know, how many seconds it is, we don't know. We don't know how many seconds it is because the Buddha's not given an answer to this. Maybe they didn't have seconds back then. For the Buddha to answer it in terms of seconds, you know, to, to, because everything is relative, right? So when you say something takes two seconds, it means one second has been defined by physicists as a time it takes for something to happen. A pendulum motion or something. I can't remember now. Long time ago. But that's how, that's how a second is defined. So two of those is two seconds. So anything that has units is measured by reference to something else. So a chittakshana is really the shortest span of time. The time it takes for a chitta to arise and pass away. When you're looking at this for say one second, you can, you can have this as working knowledge, right? But don't ask me to quote it because I, it's not in the Tripitaka. When you're looking at this for one second, Perhaps a million of these chittas, maybe billions of these chittas would have arisen and passed away. That's how fast your mind is. It's the world's fastest processor. You can't have any processor that is faster than that because nothing is faster than, not the speed of light now. Hmm? That's what you learned at school. Not the speed of light. Nothing can be faster than a chitta. So if anything was to be measured, it has to be measured in terms of a chitta, because that would be the shortest span of time. And you all have it, because chittas arise in your mind. So therefore, you can't tell how much vipaka you have left, or if you have specific vipaka, because you can't, you can't scan your pool of vipaka. We don't have that ability. We don't have that ability. So therefore, the only way you can know if you have vipaka to see this is when, it, when you see it. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? Makes sense? You, you only know you have Vipaka to see this as you're seeing it. Do you have it anymore? Yes or no? Can't tell. You can't say yes. You can't say no. If you didn't, then the moment I show this to you, you have to go blind. Some, something or the other must happen and your every opportunity for you to see this must be blocked. You will no longer see it if you didn't have Vipaka. Ah, coming back to the, your question, madam. So the good lady asked, what happens when you attain Nibbana? What happens to your leftover karma, residual karma? There's two types of Nibbana. There's the local one and the international one. Huh? The imported one and the local one. Huh? There's Sopadi says a Nibban and there's the thing called Anupadi says a Nibban. To put it in very simple terms, what we are all striving for is Sopadi says a Nibban, which is to eradicate all defilements. When the mind is free of Raga, Dvesha, and Moha, we call that Sopadi says a Nibban. Okay? There's a way that the word is formed and there's an etymology behind that, but let's not get bogged down in details. One of these days, we'll talk about it. Are we in a rush to attend Nibbana? Nibbana doesn't work like that. You can't rush to Nibbana because the moment you start rushing, you've lost Nibbana. You have to let Nibbana to come to you. You can't go after, go after Nibbana, so don't try that. The moment you start trying to go after Nibbana, you've, you've, you've lost it. It's a bit like asking, what is the sound of silence? 
Hmm? If you go around trying to listen to the sound of silence, yeah. If someone say, "Can you please? I want to listen to the sound of silence. Can you? Can you? Can you show it to me, please?" Is that the sound of silence? Oh, is that the sound of silence? See, every time you try to listen to the sound of silence, what have you done? You've destroyed silence, right? So silence has to come to you. You've got to wait for it. Nibbana works the same. You have to wait for it. Nibbana will come to you. For Nibbana to come to you, all you have to do is create the conditions and earn merits. As you do merits, as you listen to the Dhamma, the conditions will be right. And once the causes are there, these two things will come together and the effect of Nibbana will happen. The effect of Nibbana will happen. So, Sopadi says a Nibbana is you freeing yourself of all defilements. Then there's such a thing called Anupadi says a Nibbana. Anupadi says a Nibbana is what we refer to as Parinirvana. Now, on Vesak, right, we commemorate three things the birth of the prince, not the Buddha. First of all, the birth of the prince. Secondly, the birth of the Buddha. That was the day he attained Sopadi Sesa Nibbana. The day under the Bodhi tree where he was free of all defilements, he had attained Sopadi Sesa Nibbana. That is the Nibbana that we are all striving for. And then the third thing that we commemorate on, po- on Vesak Day is his attaining to Anupadi Sesa Nibbana, which is passing away into Parnirvana. <coughs> While the Buddha or any of us are still alive, that is a condition. See, your bodies, hmm, we have a body, flesh and bones, our bodies, it's a condition. Let me ask you this question to make sense of this. Someone gets a cough. You get a cough because you have a body, right? If you didn't have a body, if there was no body, then you wouldn't have a cough. Someone gets a rash. If you didn't have a body, you wouldn't get a rash. Someone gets a cancer. If you didn't have a body, then you wouldn't get a cancer. But the presence of a body is not the only thing that determines that. That's why not because, you know, just because we all have, just because you have a body doesn't mean you're going to get a cancer. Because you need the causes for that also. But if you, even if you had all of the vipaka to get a cancer, but you didn't have the conditions, then the cancer wouldn't manifest either. Now, on the back of, uh, back of, uh, Cigarette packets. I don't know in Sri Lanka, but in other countries I've seen it. Do they? It says smoking causes cancer? Yeah, all right. So on the back of these fag packs, they have smoking causes cancer. How true is that? What is cancer? Is it this, this, or this? Is it a cause, condition, or effect? Effects and effect. Right? So this is your cancer. Now this is smoking causes cancer. What is smoking? Is it a cause or a condition? What do you think? Hmm? Smoking is? It's a condition. Smoking is a condition. So would it be right to say then that smoking causes cancer? This is smoking. Smoking is a condition. Cancer is the effect. There's a part of the puzzle that's missing here. (laughs) Causes. That's why not everyone who smokes gets a cancer. That's why you don't actually have to smoke (laughs) to get a cancer. So, you tell me, smoking causes cancer. Is that right? 
all wrong. I'm not going to answer because I'm the one on camera, not you. <laughs> right? And then I'm going to get my slap wrist. No, wrist slap <laughs> Right? So smoking causes cancer if you have the causes for it. Smoking is a condition. You need to have been a cancer to others in the past. I'll say that again. And mark those words and remember them for the rest of your lives. You need to have been a cancer to others and thereby generated karmic energy. And then smoke for that karmic energy to come to fruition to you as cancer. Have you not seen people who are a cancer to society? Wherever they go, they're a menace. And when they're doing that, they're generating karmic energy. I've heard from my teachers. <clears throat> That it's a bad idea to wear revealing clothes. Now, if you don't accept this, put it, put it away. Like, don't get into a conflict with this, because that's not the point. I'm only trying to help. <clears throat> Excuse me. Revealing clothes with the purpose or with the intention of igniting the fire of desire within another human being. Because intention is karma. Whenever you do things with intent, that generates karmic energy. Every single time. If you do something with intention, that generates karma, karmic energy. And now that karmic energy awaits an opportunity to come to fruition. So I've learned from my teachers. And so I share it with you. With the same spirit. And that is... To save you from future misery. Because once it happens, it's too late, isn't it? Right? Whether you agree or not, right? once it happens, it's too late. Then there's no point talking about it after that. If you do things, if you wear revealing clothes, with the intention of creating lust, igniting lust, desire, because desire is a fire. Natira go samanagi. There is no fire like the fire of desire. When desire arises, last week we spoke about this. Lust yeah, and desire. When lust and desire arises in a man's heart, ladies and gentlemen, he suffers or she suffers no end. Whether you can acquire what you want or you can't acquire what you want, either way you suffer. Yeah? It is not only those who don't have what they want suffer. Even those who have what they want, they still suffer. They still suffer. So if desire arises in one's heart, now you've just cursed them. So if, if someone wears revealing clothes with the intention, it's only with that intention. Now if you, if you wear, now, if you take, uh, say in the Western world, right, they have very little sunlight. Right, throughout the year, it's mostly gloomy. So when the sun is out, people, they go out sunbathing and all sorts, right? Chances are, and I, but I can't say this for certain, but chances are they're not doing that to, to, to ignite lust or desire in a, in a man's heart or in a woman's heart or any, in a human being's heart. They're just doing it for, because that's the only time of the year they're going to get some sun. So when the news, when the weather reports say that, you know, today the temperature is going to be 26 degrees, then everyone's out on the beach. And people are sunbathing, putting sunscreen on. And, you know, that's how people, that's because that's the only sun they're going to get. But you can't, you can't decide, you can't judge someone's intentions by looking at what they do. Can you? Can you? No, you can't. The only way you can judge someone's intention is if you could actually examine their chittas. And can we do that? No. So what's the only way we can judge someone? 
We? We can't. That's why it's so foolish to be judgmental about other people's actions. You, you can never judge someone else. Why someone does something. But this is, for, this is good advice for us each, of us, each of us individually, because we know what our intentions are, although no one else does. Yeah? So if our intention is ever to inspire lust, desire, these feelings in another man's heart, and if you wear revealing clothes, because generally think about where people get cancers. You know, most, most, most common cancers around the chest area. Right? Around the mouth, face, facial area. Think about how people use these organs. There's only so much I can say in a sermon. You'll need to work out the rest. Think about how people use their, their bodies. A human body that was given by God to attain Nibbana. Right? So a mouth is there so you can eat. So you can speak. Speak good things. Eat wholesome things. Speak wholesome things. That's what a mouth is there for. But today, because of ignorance, people use it for all sorts of wicked and wild things. Half of the time, things that people say are terrible. Words can break up families, can't they? They can start wars. A word is mightier than a sword, isn't it? That's how people use their mouths. And for other sensual delights. Let's just keep it there. And when, they, when, when you use your bodies to ignite lust or desire in another man's heart, you're now infecting that other individual with a cancer. I'll prove it to you. Because the cancer spreads. See how cancers work? Once you get a cancer, I mean, that is a cancer by definition, right? It just spreads profusely. And it just keeps on spreading. Every good cell is killed in the process because it is starved of nutrition. Because the cancerous cells, they, they reproduce so rapidly, out of control. And the good cells, they are starved of nutrition. They are starved of oxygen. They're starved of space, and that's, that's usually how death occurs as a result of that. See, don't you think the same thing happens when you put lust into a man's heart? It starts, off, it starts off as something very little, but then over time it grows. Take a trip back memory lane. And remember, remind yourself how when desire arose in your heart, when lust arose in your heart, heart where it started and where it ended, You know, your child at home, he wasn't always addicted. He wasn't always addicted to pornography. It all started when a friend of his at school showed him a picture of a naked woman. He said, Machan, look at this. That's where it all started. But today, You can't see, and there's no end in sight. So what happened? It grew just like a cancer. Just like a cancer, it grew. Over time, it just kept on growing. Now do you see, karma was done to be a cancer to another person. Therefore, cancerous with karmic energy is up there, waiting to come to fruition. All you have to do is create the, create the conditions. So now when the conditions are right, these causes come to fruition and you get a cancer. So from my perspective, in other words, the lens of the Dhamma behind every cancer is a bad deed. I know I'm not going to win any votes by saying this. So I'm not going to run for president anytime soon. Because this is not what people want to hear. Especially someone who has a cancer. Generally, this is not what someone wishes to hear unless they are willing to come to terms with what's going on with their lives and 
now they want to change their ways and they want help. They're willing to change their ways. But usually, you know, people, they feel like they're being offended. We give people the truth not to offend them because we love them. So we can save them from future misery. If you're walking in the dark and you're about to fall into a pit, is it because I hate you or I love you? I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, watch out, there's a pit. Is it out of love or hate? I say, it's out of love. But just imagine they've just fallen into a pit. They've walked, just about got themselves back up and now they're dusting the, you know, the, the dirt off them and they're, they're a bit, little bit embarrassed because they fell into a pit. And now I tell them, you're going to fall into a pit. How dare you? Stop insulting me. Because now they're pretending like nothing ever happened. So then it becomes a catch-22. You can't help people because they don't want to be helped. Let's never be like that. That's why I said, we can never change the world, ladies and gentlemen, because the ways of the world are fixed. Although there's nothing fixed in this world, right? somehow, sometimes we feel like people's temperaments, their attitudes, right? they're so fixed that not in a million years can you change some people. But we still keep trying, because that is what Nibban is for us. The day I give up trying to fix someone is the day I lose my Nibban. My task is to keep trying. Their task <laughs> is to remain adamant <laughs> and stubborn and not change. That's their task. This is my task. One of us gets to Nibban. And then later on, one day they realize, ah, this is what he was trying to tell me. Now I want to change. And then they start on the journey to Nibban. Don't you think I must have been a very stubborn idiot in my journey of Sansar? Otherwise, I would not be here today. How many Buddhas have come and gone? That's the thing. When you know too much for your own good, not seen people like that? Hmm? Go look in the mirror. That's the thing. Once we lose our humility, if we lose our humbleness, if we lose our down-to-earthness, then we've lost it all. <clears throat> Vanity is the greatest disease. Vanity. All other diseases can be cured, besides vanity. <clears throat> so whenever you do good deeds and bad deeds, that creates karmic energy. Now, what about when you've given a dhani? <clears throat> Excuse me. When you make an alms offering, again you generate karmic energy. But aren't there times where you're hungry? I mean, all of you will have given alms by now, right? If you, even if you hadn't tried it at home, every Sunday morning you get an opportunity to do that, right? So by this point, you'll have been giving alms continuously, well, maybe for a whole year now, every week, not every month like it used to be. See, your merits, that's what it is. Merits bring further merits. How does that work? How does merits create the platform for further merits? Here's how. When you have merits, and there are conditions, usually brought about by noble association, initially, that creates an effect. Yeah? That effect is a wholesome effect. It's a wholesome effect because it was created by merits. Now, that effect becomes a condition. This effect becomes a condition. When that effect becomes a condition, now it starts drawing on complementary karmic energy. Because the effect is now a wholesome effect, it becomes a wholesome condition, therefore wholesome karmic energy starts to draw. Now what do you have? You have a virtuous cycle. See? That's how merits help you draw even more merits. This is why it is so incredibly difficult, although I Resolve to do it right at the start of Rajagiriya sermons, to go on arms to those poor people who have never given in their lives. Hmm? 
you stop me i wanted to go begging so that they could earn some merits and can produce some karmic energy so that they could achieve some comfort in life and maybe some day attain nibban but you get in their way you know i'm just gesturing right but actually that's what's going on i of course you have no intention to block me from going there because if you had then that would be bad karmic energy that's why i didn't stop you either from doing so do you think i would let you do something bad under my under my eyes if i knew that you were doing it out of spite for them do you think i would have allowed you to continue doing that no i would have refused your arms as you as you prepare to serve i i'd, I'd put my hand over my arms bowl and no more arms will be accepted then or i would turn my arms bowl upside down that is what the buddha said then you can't serve anymore I don't do that because I know you don't do it with out of bad intention. You only do it out of devotion. You are you do it because you want to earn, earn merits, right? And you want to attain nibbana. So you see, those who have merits, they continue to create effects which become conditions which draw on even more merits and it keeps on pumping merits back into their karmic energy. Therefore you go you 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 move closer every time you do so to nibbana. that's how it works it's like a slippery slope both for good and bad and then of course you have also have the vicious cycle you also have the vicious cycle when you start doing bad things who are the kind of people who come gather around you saints no bad people right they are attracted to that they are drawn to that and then what happens now they start doing because that those bad friends become a bad condition or other environment and therefore because there's a bad environment now bad karmic energy starts to draw because you know when a bunch of burglars get together what do they talk about burglary they talk about stealing they talk about theft they talk about breaking banks that's what they talk about so as they start talking about those things they start doing things and therefore that environment would never create would never start drawing on good karmic energy that they've done in the past it just keeps on tapping into bad karmic energy they've done in the past so therefore these conditions with those causes create a bad effect now that effect becomes another condition and then it starts drawing on more karmic energy now it becomes a vicious cycle now if you understood all that let me ask you a question okay who's the doer who is the doer <laughs> who's the doer there is no doer not doer <laughs> who's the doer there's no doer there's just a process I've just explained to you your karma and vipaka process. So it's not your karma and vipaka process. Remember what we talked about last week? What you give is what you get. Was it last week or the week before? Can't remember now. Week before? Yeah. We we crossed out you from that statement. All there is is give and get. See? Give and get. Give and get. Give and get. Is this not God? Now don't you understand how God works? This is how God works. That's why when you are good, God gives you gifts. When you are bad, God punishes you. Yeah. This is how he works. Mother yeah but they still have a good life yeah oh yes 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 i was waiting for that question <laughs> exactly so again what the good lady is asking how comes swami knows that there are people who there are a lot of people in the world who do terrible things atrocious things 
and yet they live a good life. How is that possible? This is how it's possible. It's possible because right now there are conditions which keep drawing on their good karma. Right? Just imagine a person is born into a wealthy family. Okay? A boy, a child born into a very wealthy family. And a wealthy family means they have conditions. That's what money is after all. Wealth is that. It's a condition. Wealth is a condition that, that, that draws on good karma. That's what wealth does. Most of the time. There are times when it can also draw on bad karma. I mean, if someone finds out that you're wealthy and they want to have some of that, now it can be both a blessing and a curse. But when there's a condition of wealthiness, if that is the condition that you have been fortunate to be born into, there will be people who will be drawn to that. Now, someone who's born into a wealthy family, they may be influenced by their parents, by their friends, by their neighbors, by the people that they associate. You know, one of two ways it could happen. One kind of people could be, you know, we have, because we've given in the past, let's be charitable. Let's give as much as we can. Let's help those who need. God has gifted us so that we can do his job. Isn't that a wonderful way of thinking about it? Hmm? God has gifted me so that we can be of service. So that we can do his job. I feel like that. God has gifted me with the Dhamma so that I can do his job and teach you all how to go to God. How to go to heaven. So someone who's born into a wealthy family, that is only one of the conditions. Being born into a wealthy family is only one of the conditions. Remember, this is a complex. This is quite complex. This is not one condition. There are a gazillion factors working here. There are lots and lots and lots of conditions going on. So, it might be that although they are wealthy, they're into uh, the slave trade. Or maybe they're into the sex trade. Or maybe they're selling guns, weapons, that sort of thing. Or maybe they're doing some other nefarious activities. That attracts the bad kind of association. Now, if in your families you are wealthy, you have to be particularly careful about your children. Right? If you are someone I'm talking about, you know exactly what I mean because you're like a honeypot. A honeypot draws towards it both butterflies. Uh, and uh, sorry, bees, as well as other insects, creepy crawlies that you don't that you don't want, right? So if you are someone who de has descended from a wealthy family and you have children, you have to be extra careful about them because they attract interest from all types of people. So when you send your child to school, you got to be careful who sits next to them. Because people will come to try to associate with them, not for their friendship, but for what's in their pocket. Because of who his father is. And in fact, you know, you, you, may have, you, they may, you may have come across people, ladies and gentlemen, who've come into your lives, not because of who you are, but what they can get out of you. Yeah, so just because there's one condition which is wealthiness, that doesn't mean that you will always end up doing good things. Because association is key. It's crucial. Is a, is a knife a good thing or a bad thing? A knife. I'll ask you a question. One day you see a man stabbing with another man with a knife in their stomach. What do you do? Who do you ring? Who do you ring? You see a man stabbing another man with a knife in the stomach area. Who do you ring? The police? Yeah? I'm talking about a surgeon. Gotcha. So a surgeon's trying to do an operation and you ring the police. Are you nuts? 
See, immediately you thought I was talking about right? so, you know, maybe uh, someone, uh, you know, a gang member or someone, right? Or a thief or a murderer stabbing someone. That's what you thought, right? So is a knife a good thing or a bad thing? You can't tell like that. How can you say whether a knife is a good thing or a bad thing? Because you can use it to slice bread just as much as you can use it to stab someone. Again, stabbing someone can be for the right reasons, can be for the wrong reasons. So it's always intention, remember, always intention. So you can't say whether a knife is a good thing or a bad thing. It's neither good nor bad. What about money then? What is money, good or bad? Same, money is the same. What about knowledge? Same. Some use it for good. Others use it as a power for destruction. So, someone's born into a wealthy family, good or bad. Is that going to end up doing them good or bad? What do you think? Hard to tell. You can only say after the fact. <laughs> because that is only one of the conditions, ladies and gentlemen. There will be plenty of other conditions, such as who he associates. When asked from the Buddha, Venerable Sir, what do you think is the most important factor when it comes to a man developing himself and working towards his spiritual liberation, spiritual wholesomeness, and you know, just becoming a better human being. The Buddha said, the number one reason is noble association. Good, wholesome association. He didn't say it was money. He didn't say it was health. Neither health nor wealth. In comparison to noble association, ladies and gentlemen, everything else is insignificant. Because you see, if you are poor today, all you need is a good teacher. No? If you are poor today, all you need is a good teacher. Because what can a good teacher teach you? How to become wealthy. If you are unhealthy, what do you need? A good teacher. A good doctor. Because what can they teach you? How to become healthy. See, that is what association is all about. Here's another question. You're wealthy today. To make you go bankrupt, what do you need? <laughs> exactly. A bad teacher. Or a bad friend. Because they can drain you of your last penny. Have you not in your life seen people who used to live the good life? Hmm? Either they won the lottery or... They inherited a large inheritance from, from their families, but today they struggle to make ends meet. And if you look into their lives, unless something really misfortunate must have happened to them, if you look into their lives closely, you will realize that they fell into what association? Bad association. Isn't that why parents are so careful about who their children associate? Absolutely, and it must be so. Absolutely. So much so, mothers, fathers, I tell you this. It's okay not to feed your children. Let them be hungry for a few days. It's not going to kill them. But be careful about who they associate. Because once an indoctrination is dropped in the mind, once desire is planted in the mind, once greed is planted in the mind, once jealousy is planted in the mind, once anger and hatred is planted in the mind, because all you need are a few words to do that. All you need are a few words. You know what Anil said about you? You know this Kathy? You know what she said about you? She said all these horrible things about you. She said you are ugly. That's all you need. Now, those two people hate each other. Or at least the person who, hate, who heard it hates the other person. And hatred begets hatred. You know how it works? I know I'm sidetracking and I know it's 10.30. <laughs> hatred begets, begets hatred. Here's how it works. Let's just say one day I, I, I approach this fine gentleman and I tell him, Sir, did you know this lady? She's been bad-mouthing you. She's saying that you're a terrible man. You're evil. 
Now, if this gentleman accepts what I have said, if he takes my word for it, until now, he had no problem with the good lady. There were no problems among them. You know, they were just friends, at least acquaintances. Right? No particular friendship, but you know, they didn't have anything between them. No resentment or whatever. But if he accepts my word now, here's what he's going to do. Next time the gentleman sees the lady, he's going to make her known. He's going to make her know that he doesn't like her. If he's accepted my word. So where there used to be a smile, there is no longer a smile. Now there may be a smirk. Now he might start saying bad things. Might start saying little things to hurt the other person. And here's what happens then. So now this innocent lady, who until now had no issue with this gentleman, begins to wonder, why is this man being like this to me? I never said anything bad about him. I never did anything bad to him. But why is he, why is he, why is he treating me like this? This is so unfair. He's a bad man. He must be a bad man. That's why he's treating me like this. Now she, now she, has, she has changed her opinion about this gentleman from someone who was you know, someone who's just another person to a bad person. So how do we deal with bad people? We are bad to them. So even if she used to smile, she no, she no longer smiles. Now she looks away. Now the two of them look away. They don't share. They don't care. And then, before you know it, the two of them are enemies. But they hadn't spoken a word with each other. <laughs> See how I transformed two people from just acquaintances to arch enemies? It was all my doing. <laughs> Bad association. Na bhaje papa ke mitte. Na bhaje puri sadhame. Bhaje ta mitte kalyane. Bhaje ta puri suttame. The Buddha says, never associate evil friends. Now you can't then call them evil friends, but that's the word. Na bhaje papa ke mitte. Papa is evil, sins, unmeritorious deeds. Nabhaje. Don't associate. Nabhaje purisadhame. Adhama is bad, vicious, vile. Don't associate them. You know, this is the Buddha, ladies and gentlemen, who gives this advice. So we can't take it lightly. He says things because he knows. He knows the impact that bad association can have on, on, on a person. It can completely ruin your samsara, not just his life. Sir? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a very good question. Is that also your vipaka? Yeah. If you give bad association, you sow the seeds for bad association. Today, if you are among good friends, it's because you've been a good friend to others. If you are among bad friends, it's because you've been a bad friend to others. It's a catch-22. See, think about this for a second. Today, you get to hear the Dhamma because you've given something wholesome to others. You may not have given the Buddha Dhamma. Maybe this is the first time you've come across the Buddha, uh, Buddha's dispensation. So how could you have given the Buddha Dhamma to get Buddha Dhamma? Yeah? But here's what you would have given. You've given someone your, your heart and soul. You've given someone happiness. You've given someone joy. You've given someone everything you had. You've given someone the best of what you had. Not the second part, the first part. That's why our ancestors, whenever they made, they cooked rice at home. Yeah? Whenever they cooked at home, who got the first part? The Buddha got the first part. The Buddha got the first part. Every morning, this is what our Sihaleas used to do. Our ancestors, our forefathers, this is what they used to do. Every morning they wake up, before they take a sip of water, they would take some warm water and offer it to the Buddha. See, the first part to the first and foremost. 
to that which is supreme, to that which is highest, to that which is purest, you offer the first part, the first portion. Come to me. But what if you're not a Buddhist? Can you not do that? You still can. Whoever you believe is a higher power, is superior, is greater, is wiser, is more noble, is kinder, more compassionate. Because these are the higher powers, these are the higher, a higher sense of being. This is what we all must aspire to, to be good, to be better, to be great. So to whatever you think is greatest, if you think the sun is the greatest, then offer it to the sun. If you think the moon is the greatest, then offer it to the moon. People used to do that. They, we used to have sun followers. Sun, they, people used to think the sun gods, and they offered it to the sun, sun god. They offered it to the moon god. Back then. If you think the Himalayas is the greatest thing that mankind has ever witnessed, then offer it to the Himalayas. Will you earn merits out of it? The Himalayas don't have any potential to give you any merits. But because you have joy in your heart, because you have devotion in your heart, because you have obeisance in your heart, because you have respect in your heart and reverence in your heart, you will earn, still, you will still earn an amount of merits. It's not going to be the full package. Because to earn, your, for your merits to really qualify as bold, big and grand merits, two parts have to come together. Partly your contribution and the other contribution comes from Vipaka. In other words, what you're actually offering to. That's why there is no offering that is greater than an offering that you make to the Buddha and the Mahasanga. Because they are supreme. Vita Raga, Vita Dosa, Vita Moha. In other words, ultimate happiness. After all, what do all human beings wish to aspire to? Happiness, right? Isn't this where we started our conversation many, 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 many months ago? We are all here in this world for one thing and one thing alone, and that is for happiness. Why do people worship gods? For happiness. Why do people go to the zoo? For happiness. Why do people cook a meal? For happiness. Why do people get married? Happiness. Have children? Happiness. Go on trips? Happiness. Name one thing people do not for the sake of happiness. No, why do people wage war? What for? Happiness. Don't you think so? If I believe that killing another human being makes me happy, then I'll kill him. People wage war for happiness. But what they don't realize is they're not giving happiness so they don't get happiness back. But they do it thinking that it's going to make them happy. <laughs> so people do everything that they do for the sake of happiness. But there is only one ultimate happiness in this universe. And that is a chitta that has no raga, desha, or moha. Where a chitta is free of desire, aversion, and delusion, that is where supreme, unconditional, ultimate happiness exists. Nowhere else. So therefore, if you can discover where supreme, ultimate, unconditional happiness exists and give to that, then you will get back the same. Again goes back to what you give is what you get. See, it's all logical. There is science, there is meaning, there is rhyme and reason behind all of these things, ladies and gentlemen. You just need to hang in there. <laughs> All will come, come to light with time. I, I mean, I can't, I can't give you everything I know in, in a day, can I? You won't come back the next day. <laughs> you know, that's, that, that's why I, I deliberately, I pace these sermons. I, some days we talk about the core Dhamma concepts. We get into the real depths of the Dhamma. Right? We just put our gloves on, put our boots on and really get into the mud right? and we start playing with the Dhamma and most of the time 
some people some people fall asleep <laughs> because the conditions sometimes are not right for them either it's too hot or they've had a heavy breakfast huh? or they've or they've uh, worked the previous night that's why saturday nights if you're coming for sunday morning sermons it's better you get some sleep because if the conditions aren't right then no matter how much i keep trying i can't i can't draw on your good merits i can't do that so it's not just my sermon that keeps you awake it's also your good merits but i do try that's why i you know i try and make it interesting that's why from time to time i crack a joke to make you laugh it's not because i'm a joker i don't need to make you laugh i mean personally if i could just give you nibbana here come and take it if you want it otherwise go if i could just give you nibbana like that i would because it's easier it's simpler straightforward but it doesn't work like that this is as much a science as it is an art so if i have compassion within my mind within myself i need to look at all of you sometimes you know part of the room they're very awake they're very engaged in another part of the room they're dead right so so then i start shifting my focus towards that side of the room sometimes i look at the back and i keep my stare some people are she is looking at me <laughs> <laughs> then i start asking questions sometimes i give you something to think about anything did swami must just offend us at least then you'll stay awake thinking if swami must offended you <laughs> and then at the end of the sermon i said that was not meant to offend you all done deliberately because at the end of the day i want you to walk away with one effect to me it matters not what journey you take ultimately if you arrive to the destination i want you to arrive then this would have been worthwhile some will go straight others will take detours others will have a hundred questions before they are happy to accept what i have to say others have no questions at all so i mean also what do you say so i mean i'll do that there are some like that then there are the swami knows what you said today where do we start right let's go back to the beginning <laughs> and and they will dissect it analyze it cut it slice it <laughs> that's that's the way they are that's okay horses for courses everyone has their cup of tea and that's okay because i love all of you the same one child is more inquisitive the other is more docile you know they'll take it just as you give it to them you know there are two children a mother has one eats when she feeds her put that open him out ah put that take this mm. put that swallow it mm. that the other child she has to run around the house which child does a mother love more if she is a mother which child does she love more both the same what if they they change their temperaments like one fine day the child who she had to run after now he is happy to sit down and he serves himself and he eats but the other child now he started throwing up throwing up a fuss and now he's running around does the mother's love change accordingly no because a mother's love is unconditional in that sense and that's what we do here but it's not just for me no answer you are all playing a part see you are creating conditions ladies and gentlemen that's why i always been giving you credit for that this is not just me blowing your trumpets i'm not doing that this is not me just flattering you not so this is the truth do you see the truth I'm not just flattering you for the sake of flattery. No. I wouldn't do that. Just to put you on a on a pedestal? No. And feed your ego? No. Wouldn't do that. I tell you that you are part and parcel of what happens here is because you are part of the conditions. Your smile as you greet someone who walks in through these doors. You making sure that everyone has a seat when they walk in. you making sure that if 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 someone comes in for the first time you show them where the washrooms are so that they never put into any discomfort 
So even when they're in the sermon, if they wish to use, use the washrooms, they don't have to trouble anyone else. Because, you know, there may be some who are, who are very polite. That when they, if they begin to feel a little bit uncomfortable, because they don't want to bother someone else in a sermon, they might, they might, not, they might not say. And then they'll hold it until the end of the talk. But if you can show them where the washrooms are, now they don't need to bother anyone. Even that, it all makes a difference. Every little helps, ladies and gentlemen, every little helps. And because you all do it with the best of intentions, every time you do something like that, you're creating good karma. As you usher someone to a seat, you're, you're offering, you're making good karma, you're generating good karma. If someone walks in and they don't have, you look like you know, they're thirsty or they're, they're, they're coughing and they don't have any water. If you offer to them a cup of water, a glass of water, your bottle, if you want to, again, you're creating good karma. Because what have they come for after all? They've come for the purpose of Nibbana, right? So really, you're not just offering to them. What are you offering to? You're offering to the cause of Nibbana. Therefore, what do you get back? Nibbana. See how the community that you create here propels you to Nibbana? Now do you have to take my word for it or have you just understood the principle behind it? There you go. Now you don't have to take my word for it. Don't take my word that there is such a thing called Nibbana. Understand it. I'm not asking you to go to a Nibbana that I see, but you have to believe because I say so. Nibbana doesn't work like that. I need you to see the same Nibbana that I'm looking at. And then you will start walking yourself. That is called empowerment. We are here to empower you. I can't walk your walk for you, ladies and gentlemen. You know that. Oh, how I wish I could. Then I'd walk each and every one of you to Nibbana. As you say, for all the times you've been mothers and fathers to me, I owe you that debt. For every drop of milk and every, blood of, every drop of blood you have shed on my behalf, I owe you that debt. I owe you. But this is the only way in which I can repay that debt. I can't hold your hand and take you to Nibbana. Here's what I can do though. Over there. Can you see that? No, no, not that one. That one. No, no, that, that one. That's Nibbana. Got it? Got it. Right, now start walking. That's what we do. Do you understand how this works now? Did you have a question, Madam? Okay. So when you attain Paranibbana, I didn't answer that, did I? No. <laughs> when you attain Paranibbana, I was talking about bodies. That's when I got sidetracked. Your bodies, I was talking about cancers and so on, and then we got sidetracked, yes. Your body is a condition that, when present, creates the environment for Vipakas to be drawn. So, attaining Parinibbana, which is Anupadisesa Nibbana, is where the five aggregates, Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara and Vinyana, essentially your bodies and your minds, let's keep it simple for the time being, your bodies, Okay, your bodies, when your body breaks down, meaning you're dead, the mind, the last chitta that was born, if it does not commit a karma, if the last chitta that, that, is, that was born does not commit a karma, because a karma is required for pratisandhi, which is what is called the Pratisandhi Karma. Right? Some of this you might have to take at face value for now. But just as I have explained these concepts, give it time and I will explain these things to you, how they work. But 
let's not be rushed about it. Right? If you start rushing to get your Dhamma, then it won't work like that. All right? So let's take our time. The last chitta that is born in this body, that arises in this body, if it does not commit a karma, such a chitta, the purpose of such a chitta, remember I said every chitta as it arises and passes away, it, it leaves the conditions for the next chitta to arise. A chitta that does not commit a karma, if it is born in a body that can no longer sustain itself, that's what old age does, right? Your body starts to, it becomes fragile, becomes frail and starts falling apart. When your heart beats for the last time, because your heart can no longer beat, now it's, it's giving up. And at the same time, the chitta that arises for the last time, where that is a chitta that does not perform a karma, okay? Because it does not perform a karma, it does not generate energy to compose matter that exists in this universe. It does not compose matter that exists in this universe and bring matter together to create another body for a chitta to be born. I think 5% of that made sense. <laughs> I'll try again one more time. If not, we'll leave it. For now, we'll leave it. We'll come back to that another day. So as I was saying, every chitta that arises and passes away, it creates an environment for the following chitta. Okay? When a chitta is born, if that chitta does not create karma, does not do karma, if you don't understand exactly what I mean by karma, we'll talk about that again another day. It is the process of creating jati. That's what karma is. Creating, creating jati. Paricha samupada. At the end of that is, that is where karma is born. If it does not do a karma, and this is also, it, it, this, this point also coincides with the body giving up. You know, your vital organs, when they give up, that's it, right? Your body can no longer sustain. I mean, that's why an arahant doesn't die soon after becoming an arahant. Right? So it's not just the mind that keeps going, the body also creates an environment for the mind to continue. Otherwise, the other should be true as well, shouldn't it? The moment you become an arahan, your body should disintegrate. That's not how it works. Because there is sufficient energy from karma, karma that was generated before becoming an arahan, to keep the body going. Okay? But there comes a point where your bodies, which are formed of matter, when they can no longer sustain itself, and that coincides with the last chitta, that is born, that does not commit a karma, when that body decomposes, bad choice of word, because you're thinking decomposes when it rots. That's not what I mean. Let's say disintegrates. When that body breaks down, at that point, because another karma is not committed, a pratisandhi karma is not committed, a rebirth karma is not committed, what does not happen now is matter composing again to create another body within which the next chitta can be born. Remember each chitta, not remember, try and understand, each chitta has to create the environment for the next chitta. So if the body has broken down by this point, shouldn't this chitta also create a body? Let me say that again. Each chitta, as it passes away, it has to create the environment for the next chitta. Make sense? Okay. If your body breaks down at this point, okay, if your body is giving up, this is the last beat. Let's assume that the last heartbeat and that's it. After that, it's, it's not a body that can sustain the mind. All right? So this is the last heartbeat. So there's a lub dub here, there's a lub dub before that, and this is the last lub dub. Okay? So here's the last lub dub. Last heartbeat, now, for the next chitta to be born, there has to be a body. Because Nama and Rupa, they coexist. For this Nama, which is your mind, to exist, there has to be some form of Rupa. It doesn't have to be solid Rupa like this. It can be very subtle forms of Rupa as well. 
right? But for just to keep it keep things simple, a body has to form. And for that body to be formed, this chitta must have the potential, must have the power, must have the energy to bring together matter, matter in a way that the next body can be created. So just as this is the old body, let's assume that this is the new body. Can this new body be formed like 10 years later? No, why is that? Because each chitta must take residence in some kind of body. Right? They can be dense, they can be very subtle, right? but it has to be some kind of body. So if the body can no longer sustain itself, then a new body has to be formed. But here's the problem. What if this chitta, this chitta that is now passing away does not have the potential, it does not have the power to create a new body. If it does not have the power to create a new body, now a new body cannot be formed, right? Now a new body cannot be formed. And if a new body cannot be formed, now there is no longer the conditions for the next chitta to be born. Although there is plenty of karmic energy left. Remember these are causes. Your body is a condition. Together you get the effect. Just like the cancer. You were a cancer to society. Karmic energy to give a cancer was generated. But today you smoke. Therefore that karmic energy comes to fruition. Smoking is your condition. The karmic energy your causes. Getting a cancer today is the effect. Likewise, this chitta as it passes away, if it does not have the power to compose matter in such a way to create a new body, then a new body does not, well, it's not formed, it's not created. Because for that you need pratisandhi karma. In other words, to keep it quite simple, a karma has to, be, has, to be, has to be committed in this chitta, ladies and gentlemen. But once this is an arahat chitta, you no longer perform karma. Because a karma is always based in raga, desha and moha. Punya papa pahinasa is the, is, the, is the nature of an arahan. An arahatam nuhanse does not commit karma. They simply exhaust vipaka. That's all they do. They keep on exhausting vipaka. So there was never actually a karma in this series of chittas from the moment that, it, that the arahant was formed. So in other words, let's just say, okay, so this is, this is a person who is not an arahant. Okay? If they die at this point, okay, they die at this point, this chitta has the potential to create another body. Here's the next body. And it creates it. And therefore, a pratisandhi karma is done. And therefore, a new body is formed. And therefore, because the body is now there, that is the condition for the next vipaka chitta to arise in there. And therefore, life continues. Yeah? But now they've listened to the Dhamma. They've practiced the path. And now this is an arahant we are talking of. Here, not an arahant. Died. Body disintegrated. This chitta had enough energy, had the potential, had the power to create a new body because it had prasisandhi karma, right? The ability to do to perform prasisandhi karma. Therefore, a new body was formed, and that new body became the condition for the next packet of energy, karmic energy, to take fruition. Therefore, existence continued. But now they listen to the Dhamma, practice the Dhamma, and now he has become an arahan. At this point, all karma has ceased. Because so says and Nibbana has happened. What's about to happen now is Anupadi says and Nibbana. So how does that happen? In this last chitta, which coincides with the breaking down of an Arahatam Nuhanse's body, which happens with as a coincidence with the Arahatam Nuhanse's breaking down of an Arahatam Nuhanse's body, because there is no energy to create another body, at this point. This no longer happens. A new body is not created. Because a new body is not created, now, although there are causes, what you don't have are conditions or the environment. 
Because there is no environment, now these causes cannot take fruition. Therefore, existence has ceased. I'll give you a paper on this next week. <laughs> Don't worry, just MCQs, okay? <laughs> you know, all of this sounds very interesting. I know it does. And that's why I don't talk about a lot of this. <laughs> My purpose is not to interest you in the Dhamma. I'm very careful about what we are doing here, ladies and gentlemen. I have a vision. I have a very clear vision and I have a crystal clear vision of where I want to take you. My purpose here is not to interest you in the Dhamma. My purpose here is to interest you in Nibbana. Dhamma is not Nibbana. That's why I don't spend a lot of time talking about these concepts. Madam? Yeah. To get to Nibbana, all you need to understand is Anichadukha and Anatta. We earn merits and we understand Anichadukha and Anatta. Provided you understand, you, you, you do merits and, and, and understand Anichadukha and Anatta, Nibbana will happen for you. When you flick the switch, do you need to understand how the electrons come from the power generators to the light bulb? Do you? Does it not, does it not work when you just flick the switch? That's the thing. You need not understand all of this. You need not understand all of this. All you need to understand is do some merits and understand the principle, the, the overarching principle of this cosmos, the, the theory of everything. The theory of everything is anicca. Anicca, dukkha and anatta. How things are manifestations and they are not entities. That is the core that you need to understand. If you understand that, you can ignore all of this. This is the subject of karma and viparkas. This is the playground of the Buddhas. I don't know what I am doing dabbling in this. <laughs> it's not our place to even talk about karma and viparka. That's why I said, you know, this is a very oversimplified, overgeneralized, Right? I'm, I'm caveating all of this because this may not be a hundred percent the truth, but it's close enough. None of this is wrong. There's a difference between accuracy and pre precision, right? This is accurate. It may not necessarily be precise. For precision, you need the Buddha. For accuracy, in other words, is this, is this true? As in, if we, if we, if what, what I have explained to you, is this how the world works? Yes. Is it exactly how the world works? Mm, give or take. But that's okay. That's to say, my purpose with all of you is not to, you know, not to help you become doctors, PhD holders in the Dhamma. That's why we don't delve in these topics very often. That's why you find me most of the time talking to you about respecting your parents. Become a good human being giving whatever you can, treating each other with dignity, being a good father, being a good mother, being gentle, being humble, being grateful, because those things create the conditions. That's what they do. They create the conditions for your good karma to come to fruition. But of course, you need to understand the Dhamma also. But that's why I said, I, I sometimes plan it. Sometimes I don't plan it, but some, this is how it works. If you, if you to go back you know, maybe the last 10 sermons, right? what you might I, I recognize is that some sermons we go quite deep into the Dhamma. Other sermons we've hardly talked to the Dhamma at all. That's all part of the master plan. Here's something one of my mentors taught me. Don't try to beat the system. Follow it. Because it is your karma, your vipaka, 
your merits that has designed this system for you. If you believe in doing good deeds, if this is not the, the strategy that you need to get to Nibbana, then either our strategy will change or you will go where the strategy is right. The fact that you're here and you're still here means this is probably how you're going to get to Nibbana. I can put my hand on my heart and say, there is a crystal clear path to, to Nibbana. And that is what I share with you, because my task is not to get you interested in the Dhamma. It's to get you passionate, not just interested. I want you to be passionate about Nibbana. Freedom from desire, freedom from aversion, freedom from delusion, and living a happy life. If when you study all this, it becomes too much of a burden. Say you don't get a sleep, <laughs> peaceful night's sleep today because you're thinking, what did Swami Maharaj say about karma and his causes and the conditions and all? God. <laughs> if you're walking away with a headache after this sermon, right? In vain you came, right? I mean, if the sermon doesn't leave you happy, <laughs> how could the sermon ever get you to Nibbana? <laughs> Am I right? Well, there you go. And you know, it's, of course, we always have a mixed audience. I'm sure if I ask people to give me a raise of a show of hands, there'll, there'll be newcomers today also. That's always the case. But that's what we are. We're always very welcoming. We're always very embracing. We, we invite... Anyone, everyone, if you are interested in the Dhamma, not really, if you are interested in Nibbana, what does the banner say outside? Nibbana, right? Yeah, open-minded individuals who are interested in Nibbana. Jetana Rama Vihar is all about exclusively for aspirants of the Dhamma. Yes? No. Exclusively for aspirants of Nibbana. If you want Nibbana, we are here. If you want the Dhamma, I'd say run away. <laughs> You will be disappointed. Remember Portila? He got the Dhamma. What he didn't take was Nibbana. But don't you fear. Just go along with the system. But if one day you feel at the end of these sermons, you, you feel that Swami Nuhan says, encouraging you to do bad things. He's encouraging you to hate others. He's encouraging you to feel jealous about others. So he's trying to say that he's better than everybody else. He's saying that you are right and everybody else is wrong in this world. So you have to serve justice to everybody else. Right? Or you have to debate with the Dhamma. Remember what I told you the other day. On YouTube or wherever you get your consume your Dhamma sermons from. People will start commenting. Right? Every, people do that all the time. Right? They'll say, you know, this is nonsense. This is rubbish. What are these sermons? You know, they're wasting time. Don't you be the one who gets into a dogfight with them, right? And start replying to those silly comments and say, no, 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 our Swami Nuhas is the best Swami Nuhas in the whole wide world. How dare you do this? How dare you do that? I ask you, how dare you get in, embroiled in those conversations? Have I not given you anything? <laughs> Don't be that person. Let the lovers love, let the haters hate. Let those who throw flowers, throw flowers. Let those who throw rocks at us, throw rocks at us. We are happy either way. Yeah? There you go. That's the path to unconditional happiness. If I'm only happy when I receive praise and respect and when people like my talks, do you think I go online and check how many likes those videos get? <laughs> Yuck. <laughs> Don't come back to these sermons <laughs> if, if you think I do that. <laughs> That's why I don't tell you, please like them, share them, comment them. Huh? <laughs> but I will say this, if you think there's someone out there who can benefit from listening to a sermon, then send them a link. Don't force them though. Send them a link. But the best advertisement for the Dhamma is not the sermon itself. It's you. You are the best advertisement for the Dhamma. The transformation that you can demonstrate to others. Which is why it is crucial that you, as the Dhamma begins to seep in through your heart, through the rest of your body, you become a better mother. 
a better father, a better friend, a better employee, a better colleague, a better citizen, a better brother, a better sister. These are the makings of great men and women. That is the best advertisement that you can give for the Dhamma. Right. I think we should leave it there. Yes. Sadhu Sadhu, I'm happy with that. You can inform. So uh, the, there's been a suggestion made. That is, you all agree on one Sunday, but which way around? One Sunday for you or one Sunday for them? <laughs> one Sunday for them. <laughs> Start small. Okay. So the suggestion is one Sunday of the four Sundays, four or five Sundays, however many you get a month. Let's say the first Sunday, for argument's sake, the first Sunday of every month, you make an offering, not of Pindapata, but you give the gift of offering. We talked about this. Yeah? You give the gift of giving. So rather than you bring alms food for Swami Nuhanse, you let Swami Nuhanse go to the villages, to people who need to get started on this, you know, so that eventually one day they can be among you. Otherwise, you know, folks, you know, they need so much merits to be in your presence. Do you think some of the people that we go in Armstrong can even, even hope, even dream of sitting next to you? Hmm? You know who you are, right? Just, just forget the Dhamma for a second. You know who you are in society. You are very respectable people. You know who you are. Do you think those people would ever even get a chance to sit next to you? But we can create a path for that. For that, they have to be interested in the Dhamma. They can't come sit next to you to get, you know, make friends and start uh, signing up the new business contract. They can't do that. Uh, this is not a business house. We are here for the Dhamma. But if we give them an opportunity to offer something, when we go on Armstrong, we're always thinking about that. May anyone who offers anything to this put lay down the first brick to build the great wall of Nibbana. May they lay down the first brick. May they put down the first step on a long journey to Nibbana. It is a journey of a thousand leagues, but of course it must begin with the first. So that is what we do. So the good ladies made the suggestion, I'm sure on behalf of everyone, if you agree with that, we dedicate the first Sunday of every month where you don't bring any alms food on that day. Swami Nansis can go on Pindapata to the villages, right? And then every other Sunday, sorry, not every other Sunday, all other Sundays, besides the first Sunday, you can engage in your meritorious offerings. Ah. <laughs> Won't it be late after these sermons? Who's responsible for that? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yes. That's what you've done. You know, in you suggesting it and, and, and agreeing to to this proposal, you're creating the environment, you're creating the conditions to draw their good vipaka and therefore create an effect of good karma on their behalf so that that karma goes into their karmic energy and eventually one fine Sunday they will also be able to listen to a Dhamma sermon when the complementary respective conditions are created for, for a sermon to happen for them. But here's what else you are also doing. In creating those conditions, because you're doing it intently, with intention, you are also generating good karma. So that's a goodness breeds goodness. You can't do good to someone else without doing good for to yourself. Do it if you can. I dare you. 
do goodness to someone else without doing good to yourself can you okay then try this as well do harm to someone else without doing harm to yourself can you no when you do good when you do harm in both of these instances the first recipient of all that you take the lion's share you always take the lion's share ultimately actually we don't do good or bad to anyone else we only do it to ourselves so if you are all happy with that then the first sunday of every month we will dedicate that so it's a gift that we give to those who who need it to those who deserve it and let them make their offering as well all in agreement going once when is the first sunday so this is the middle of the month isn't it okay so july 1st okay no so after the sermon instead of staying back for arms i will will go on pindapatha to the villagers if no if you finish by 10:30 which is like never that is my fault partly if you finish by 10:30 that should give us enough time 7th of july okay so let's try it right now in case in case i'm delayed and i don't keep to my word right then i of course i can't go to them past 11 11:15 because it's too late uh, no 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 shush if that should happen don't worry about it don't worry about it right so what we should do is is finish at 10:30 yeah right it's already quarter past 11 right <laughs> let's wrap it up now please don't forget everything we've been discussing since morning that's the only thing you remember when you leave us swami nasus pinda pa there if 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 there were bits of this that didn't make sense i encourage you to watch it once at least when you get back home if not and some of you may not find the time we'll go over it again essentially what i wanted to get across to you was the fact that there is no doer here this is a process you all are processes so why do you take credit for a process hmm it makes no sense if if any of you felt like i am the one who reigns if any of you stood up and say i so i mean you know what i am the one who reigns what would the rest of them say about you take him to the hospital <laughs> god man yeah hmm now this is the process what do you think you think you're doing this right hmm that's why you are in the hospital this is the mental asylum and the buddha is the doctor we are the nurses as we try and treat us and heal ourselves we try and do the same for our patients so we have outpatients and we have inpatients i keep inviting you to come to the come to the wards and admit yourselves and take treatment but you keep visiting the opd <laughs> what can we do <laughs> may you all, all earn enough merits in good time so that you can also become an inward patient hmm and treat yourselves and cure yourselves of this illness and become doctors yourselves become nurses yourselves right let's transfer merits and bring today's sermon to a close all right <clears throat> Let us all take a moment to transfer the merits that we have all acquired by inviting the Swami Nuhansi to deliver the sermons, preaching the Dhamma, listening to the Dhamma, and creating a conducive environment for all to come along, practice the Dhamma in peace and comfort. Let us take a moment to transfer these merits first and foremost to the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, upasikas and upasikas, who have since time immemorial 
protected and preserved the sublime teachings of the Buddha and passed it down through the generations of the noble lineage in the form of the Tripitaka, which is thankfully available to us today to study, understand and comprehend the Dhamma. Let us also transfer these merits to all members of the Mahasangha present throughout the world, including the chief prelates of all of the chapters who've dedicated their lives to the noble path and have committed themselves towards the betterment of all sentient beings. Let us also transfer these merits to all monks and nuns resident in your local temples and nunneries who've always been by your side through thick and thin, come rain or shine. Let us transfer these merits to my teacher, Guru Swami Nuhanse, as well as all the monks resident at the monastery and the Anagarikas and Anagarika communities attached to the monastery. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to those who make great efforts to disseminate the teachings of the Buddha, be that by transliterating these talks, sharing them out with others, or inviting others to join them. May they all rejoice in these merits. Let us also transfer these merits to the friends of the monastery, our devotees, who for the sake of merits to help them attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana, continue to sustain the Mahasangha. This includes everyone from those of you who provide the Mahasangha with shelter, arms, robes, and medicines, as well as those who pass on their know-how and continue to extend their well wishes. May they all rejoice in these merits and by the power of these merits. May they be healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcome any obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these minutes to our mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews and nieces, our friends, our acquaintances, our employers and our employees, our colleagues and our teachers, as well as those who've gone the extra mile on our behalf on each and every occasion that they were able to do so, those who've helped us, supported us, and assisted us in any way, shape, or form, may they all rejoice in this medicine and by the power of these medicines, may they also be healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcome any obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer this merits to the devas and brahmas, spirits and demons, primarily the Sakadeva, as well as all the numerous gods and deities who have committed themselves to protect and preserve the Sambuddha Sasana. May they all rejoice in these merits. May they prosper in divine power and wisdom. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to those to our loved ones who are no longer with us, those who passed away in our name, our forefathers and our ancestors, reminding ourselves that it is in their blood, sweat and tears today we are able to live lives of comfort and practice the path in peace and harmony. Let us also transfer these means to members of the armed forces as well as the police force who sacrificed their lives to protect the peace and harmony of our nation, as well as friends and foe who lost their lives in the wars. Let us also transfer these means to those who lost their lives in natural disasters and calamities such as the tsunamis, earthquakes, floods, fires, landslides and pandemics and so on, reminding ourselves that in this infinitely long journey of sansara, they will all have been mothers and fathers to us, friends to us, acquaintances to us. They will have helped us, supported us, and assisted us in any way, shape, or form possible and available to them. And therefore, out of compassion and a sense of gratitude towards all that they have done for us, let us take a moment to transfer all the maids we have acquired throughout our journey in sansara to all of them. May, by the power of these maids, if any of them have been born in the woeful plains, they redeem themselves and be born in the blissful plain. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And finally, may by the power and blessings of all the maids we have acquired throughout the day, we will be able to witness the advent of many hundreds of thousands of arahants on this blessed land. And may you and I, and everyone who's helped make this program a success, become a Rahata Nuhanse or an Arahat Terani Nuhanse in this very life itself and in the era of the Gautama Supreme Buddha itself. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May the blessings of the Noble Triple Gem be with you all. The members of the Mahasangha will now transfer their blessings to you. <clears throat> Raga ginnang midatnva Desha ginnang midatnva Moha ginnang midatnva Nibbana parma sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Nibbana Parama Sukhayan 
सुखित तार मम दियलु लोक सियलु सत्वयो निबान परम सुखयन सुखित तार निबान परम सुखयन सुखित तार निबान परम सुखयन सुखित तार राग गिनी निवेवा द्वेश गिनी निवेवा मोह गिनी निवेवा निवन सप लेवा निवन सप निवन सप तुंडे सुविशी अनंत महागुण बेलेन शीलु लोक शीलु सत्त ओम निबाण परम सुखेन सुखित तरवेत्वा साधु साधु साधु